Please give it up for Dr. David Suzuki. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so honored to have this opportunity to share a few ideas with you. Uh, and before I begin, I too would like to acknowledge that this is the traditional territory of the Coastal Salish people. I like to say that not just as a perfunctory uh, expression, but simply to remind us to think back of the thousands of years that the Coast Salish people occupied this territory and took such good care of it. I'm not here this evening to speak on behalf of any group, any organization, any political party or corporation. I have to say that or else Mr. Harper will come after my ass. <laughs> so I have nothing to do with the David Suzuki Foundation in a formal way. I am here this evening to speak as a grandfather and as an elder. And I think speaking as an elder is very, very important. I feel this is the most important time in my life. You see, as an elder, we're past running after fame or money or power or even sex. Well, some elders do, but they got problems. They, they need help. And as an elder, we are no longer, we don't have to play the game and kiss backsides in order to get a job or a promotion or a raise. We're freed to speak the truth from our hearts. And if that offends people, then that's their problem, not ours. I, um, whatever happens in this next election, which is coming up soon, whoever is elected prime minister and uh, whatever parliament does in its first sessions will have very little impact on me. I'm at the end of my life. But as you heard from Mila, whatever is done or not done by the next parliament, whoever is elected prime minister will have enormous repercussions throughout the entire lives of our young people. They've got everything at stake in what's going on right now. In December of this year, 195 nations will meet at COP21 in Paris. And if we can look to the past 20 COP meetings, I don't think we can expect very much. This may be the last chance, in fact, for countries around the world to actually take this very seriously and begin to set hard targets and act in an urgent way. And I must admit, as an elder, I've become rather jaded with what I've seen throughout my lifetime. But two unexpected things have happened over the last year. Of course, there is the coming together of China and the United States actually addressing the issue of climate change, which is, to me, astounding. But of course, for an atheist to hear Pope Francis, it's almost enough to make me uh, cling to religion. Those two things, I think, uh, really set things up, I think, I hope, with great hope, for the meeting that will take place in Paris. But as Paul Ehrlich said many years ago, we've got to respond as if there are a hundred Pearl Harbors going off at once. For 10 years, the Prime Minister of Canada has said, we can't act to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, it'll destroy the economy. We elevate According to Mr. Harper, we elevate the economy above the very atmosphere that keeps us alive. I'm not an economist, but this sure as hell doesn't make much sense to me. I've, um, we, uh, I've encountered this kind of thinking about the importance of the E economy. Uh, many years ago, when I got involved, I was asked by the Lytton Indian Band if I would help them prevent logging in their sacred valley, the Stein Valley. The uh, British Columbia government had given a logging permit to Fletcher Challenge, a um, multinational corporation with headquarters in New Zealand, to uh, log the Stein Valley, and the Lytton people did not want it. So I agreed to try to help them and went camping in the valley wanted to see what they were fighting to protect. And as I was coming out of the valley, we met a party of people at the, at the trailhead, and you knew they weren't going camping because the women were dressed in high heels and, and dresses and the men were in suits. But you know, when you're on a trail and you're all grubby and you meet other people, you begin to talk. And very quickly, uh, 
I realized, holy cow, one of these guys is the CEO of Fletcher Challenge, the company that's going to log it. And very quickly he realized, holy cow, that one of these guys is that shit disturber, David Suzuki. <laughs> so needless to say, what began as a conversation quickly escalated into a shouting match. And finally, in frustration, he said, listen, Suzuki, are tree huggers like you willing to pay to protect those trees? Because if you're not willing to pay for them, they don't have any value until someone cuts them down. And that's when I realized that was, he was absolutely right. Because as long as we, begin, we argue in that, uh, in that frame, he could tell me exactly how many cubic meters of pulp there was, how many board feet of lumber, how many jobs, how much profit. And I have to go around saying, well, we could probably gather berries and uh, maybe some salel bushes to put in flower arrangements. And maybe we'll find a cure for cancer. But of course, the real reason we were fighting to prevent the logging is that those trees were taking carbon dioxide out of the air and putting oxygen back in it. Not a bad service for an animal like us. Those trees are pumping millions of gallons of water out of the soil and transpiring it in the air and modulating weather and climate. The tree roots are clinging to the soil so that when it rains, the soil doesn't run into the spawning beds of the salmon. The forest, as long as it's standing, is performing all of these services. But when we use the economy as the frame within which we must argue, then of course those, those roles, that role of the forest doesn't enter into it. And that's what, for me, doesn't make any sense. And I know that's why I was so honored to be asked to take part in this evening, that ecological economists are trying to grapple with this issue to uh, begin to see how we can internalize these kinds of services that nature performs. The problem for me is if you ask any CEO or politician, how well did you do last year? Within a picosecond, they will talk about whether or not there was growth in the GDP or, or market share or profit. Uh, growth has become the very reason why governments apparently exist, certainly the reason why uh, corporations exist. But growth to me as a biologist is simply a description of a system. Growth by itself cannot be just an end that we're all aspiring to. Surely growth is a means to some other end. But when we put growth as the very definition of progress, then no one wants to diminish progress and we don't ask the important questions like what is an economy for? Are there no limits? How much is enough? Are we happier with all this stuff that comes out of this incredibly productive economy? And those are questions I think that we have to, to ask ourselves. I believe, you see, that the measure of a society's prosperity is not in the number of obscenely wealthy people that exist in society, but <coughs> in the condition of our poorest, our weakest, our most vulnerable members of society. And in that I must say that the North America cannot uh, look uh, to itself with great pride. By that criterion, North America is not a very prosperous society. Ever since Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, I, like millions of people around the world, was swept up in what has become the modern environmental movement. And uh, I've watched with enormous uh, satisfaction the success of the environmental movement in the early years. When Silent Spring came out, there wasn't a single department of the environment in any government on the planet. And of course, now we have in departments or committees on the environment at every level uh, of government. And since that uh, book came out, we've had laws to protect air and water and da endangered species, and millions of hectares of land have been protected in parks and reserves. And for me, the, uh, some of the successes I celebrated were, uh, in being a small part of were uh, our success in stopping dams at Site C on the Peace River, and uh, in stopping a dam at Altamira in Brazil in 1989. We uh, uh, stopped super tankers coming from the Alaskan North Slopes down to, through British Columbia waters to Seattle for refining. 
stop drilling in Hecate Strait, the Alaska National Wildlife Refuge. And we celebrated all of these as great victories of the environmental movement. And yet 30, 35 years later, we find ourselves fighting exactly the same battles over again. And we realize that those victories were pyrrhic because we didn't use those battles as a way of changing the way we see ourselves uh, on the planet. So um, I think that it doesn't make sense then for us to go to Paris and negotiate the way we've been doing for the past 20 other COP meetings through uh, the lenses of 195 national boundaries and 195 national agendas, e economic agendas. So I believe that what we have to do is start from a fundamental platform of agreement for everyone around the planet. And I'd like to begin that discussion so that we all agree by suggesting that we live in a world that is shaped and constrained by laws of nature, laws that we can't change, that we have to live within. In physics, we know that we can't build a rocket that will go faster than the speed of light. And we live within that constraint. We know the laws of gravity mean that we can't have an anti-gravity machine here on Earth. And the first and second laws of thermodynamics dictate that we cannot build a perpetual motion machine. We understand that. That's physics. And that imposes those restrictions, and we live within it. And chemistry, it's the same. The atomic properties of the elements, the diffusion constants and reaction rates determine the kinds of atoms that we can chemically react and the kinds of molecules we can synthesize, and we live with that. Those are dictated by the laws of chemistry. And in biology, it's the same. Every species, and we are a species, uh, has... A, a, a number of, or maximum number of that species that can be sustained indefinitely that is defined by the carrying capacity of an ecosystem or a habitat for that species. Now humans, because of our intelligence, can adapt to many different ecosystems, but the biosphere is ultimately our domain, our ecos, as the Greeks call it, and the biosphere uh, dictates the, kind, uh, the numbers that we can, uh, that we can attain uh, on the planet. Now, of course, that number is determined in not just by numbers, but b uh, by the consumption or the amount that each of the population consumes. But uh, virtually everyone I talk to in the scientific field would say that humanity is long past the carrying capacity of the biosphere for us, the way we're living. So those, I believe, are what we have to begin with, that the dictates of science limit and constrain the way that we uh, have to live, and we have to live within that. And biology dictates or tells us that we are biological creatures, we are animals. And I've been astounded at the number of people that are offended when you say we are animals. I gave a talk in Austin, Texas, so way back in the early 2000s, and uh, I said to the, there were a number of children in the audience, and I said, now kids, if you remember one thing from my speech, remember we are animals. Man, did their parents get pissed off at me. Don't call my daughter an animal, we're a human being. To which I respond, look, if you're not an animal, are you a plant? We are animals, and our animal nature dictates some fundamental realities. What is the most fundamental thing, the, most, the greatest need every human being on the planet has? So if we're going to construct a platform of things that everyone agrees, then surely the fact that if we don't have air for three minutes, we're dead, and if we have to breathe polluted air, we're sick, surely we would have to all agree that clean air has to be the highest priority of people around the planet. And then every one of us is at least 60% water by weight. But the problem with the body is we leak water all the time out of our skin and our eyes and our nose and our crotch and we lose water, so, which means you have to drink water constantly. If we don't have water for three to four days, we're dead. If we have to drink polluted water, we're sick. So 
Surely, pollute, clean water, like clean air, has to be a part of a foundation of agreement of all people around the world. And then, of course, with food, we can last a little longer, but four to six weeks without food and you're dead. Eat contaminated food and you're sick, and most of our food comes from the earth. So surely, clean food and clean soil must be up there with air and water. And finally, every bit of the energy that we have in our bodies to move and grow and reproduce, every bit of our fuel that we burn to liberate the heat, all of that, of course, is sunlight. Sunlight captured by plants in photosynthesis, converted into chemical energy. We then get it by eating the plants or the animals that eat the plants. And when we need that energy to move or uh, at work, we burn those molecules and liberate the sun back out into our bodies. So photosynthesis should join clean earth and clean air and clean water. And I believe those should be the foundation of the way everyone lives to protect what the First Nations and indigenous people around the world call the four sacred elements for Mother Earth. Earth, air, fire, and water. And the miracle of life on Earth is that the rest of creation, the, the vast expanse of, of diverse species of plants and animals around the world, are what cleanse, replenish, create the four sacred elements. It's all of the plants that take carbon and put oxygen back into the atmosphere that keep the planet or the atmosphere breathable for an animal like us. Vancouver gets its water from three watersheds surrounded by old growth rainforest. And when the rain falls, the plant roots and tree roots and soil fungi and bacteria and microorganisms filter that water for us. And soil, I have to laugh when I hear that people are going to go to Mars and create a colony there. There's no soil in Mars. There's a lot of dust and, and sand and stuff like maybe some clay, but soil is created by life. Without life, you don't have any soil to grow plants on. And, uh, and finally, of course, all the energy is gathered by plants in photosynthesis. So in an act of enormous generosity, the rest of life on Earth, what scientists call biodiversity, is responsible for giving us, gifting us with the four sacred elements. And, uh, and uh, the uh, First Nations, as you know, refer often to other species as our relatives. And genetics confirms that. If you look at the genes in a, in a carrot plant or a cedar tree, in an eagle, a salmon or a bear, you find they carry thousands of genes identical to the genes in our bodies. They're not resources or commodities. They are our biological kin because we share a common evolutionary history. And it's that understanding, it seems to me, in th that th in gratitude we must treat and value the diverse plants and animals around the world. Those, I think, should be the foundation of the way that we live, that we protect and value those things. Other things, which we seem ready to, to kill and die to protect, borders that we draw around our cities, our provinces, our countries. Man, we'll go to war and, and kill and, and die to protect things that the rest of creation, that nature couldn't care less about whether you're a monarch butterfly flying from, from uh, Canada down to Mexico, whether you're salmon that are born in British Columbian rivers and go out through the Alaskan panhandle, swim up past Alaska along the coasts of Russia and Japan, who do they belong to? They don't care uh, what our borders mean, and we try to manage them through the dictates of our boundaries, which are meaningless to nature. We're trying to deal with the atmosphere that belongs to no one through the lenses of 195 national boundaries. How am I doing, Kai? Doing great. Okay. <laughs> I'm almost done. Thank you. <coughs> and then we create other things. <clears throat> we create uh, capitalism. We create the economy, markets, corporations. These are not forces of nature. We invented them. And yet, when you look at the newspaper, look at the business sections, you'd swear to God these are things. 
You know, we once felt that way about dragons. We really believed in dragons. And man, we'd sacrifice gold and jewels to keep them from being mad at us. But we, we know that those are figments of our imagination. But look at the way we talk about markets or the economy. You'd swear to God they were real. Th oh, market's not looking too good today. You know, and you think of this thing with a the thermometer stuck in its mouth going, oh, I feel really shitty today. You know, like, give me some good news. These are human inventions, and yet we are constantly trying to shoehorn nature to fit our political and economic demands or agendas. It doesn't work that way. You can't force nature into human-created things that don't make sense in that, in that uh, real world. We have to find ways of fitting our inventions to live within the constraints imposed by the laws of nature. And I think that's what the Ecological Society of America and of Canada are all about, is to try to find ways that this very powerful structure that we've created can fit and make sense within the, the uh, constraints of what we need, like clean air, clean water, clean soil, and so on. And uh, then we can get on with finding a way to make a living. I'd just like to end by say, in a small way, that is what the David Suzuki Foundation and Ecojustice are trying to do in what we call the Blue Dot Movement. The Blue Dot being our little planet. And uh, in the movement, we are now trying to build a grassroots support for a constitutional amendment to enshrine the right to a healthy environment in the Canadian Constitution. And then to be a Canadian means to be protected. And I, I have been astonished at the way this has resonated. We've chosen a very difficult way of getting constitutional amendments. I mean, they've been, we've amended the Constitution through Parliament, but we've chosen to do it by getting a grassroots movement to move municipalities, cities, to pass a declaration for a healthy environment and then pass that on to the premiers of provinces because in Canada we need seven premiers of provinces that contain more than half of the population of Canada. And when we get that, we go to the feds. Now, of course, we have to wait till the election. There's no way we'd have a chance in hell with Mr. Harper. But we've got to get that movement going. We started this, we launched it in September of last year. I thought if we got one municipality to pass our declaration for a healthy environment in six months, we'd be on our way. We, uh, within three weeks of our, uh, the, the beginning, we had a city, Richmond, British Columbia, and within seven weeks, when we completed a bus tour across the country, we had seven municipalities. Now there are 85, including Montreal. <laughs> it includes Montreal, and it includes St. John's, Newfoundland, it includes Yellowknife, Vancouver, Victoria, uh, Hamilton. These cities contain over seven million Canadians. We have over 18,000 volunteers working in their communities to try to get the declaration. And uh, last week, the Union of British Columbia Municipalities passed a resolution asking the Premier of British Columbia to uh, pass a declaration for a healthy environment. So we're, we're very much on our way. Thank you very much.